Hello and welcome everyone to QI Talk Time. Um, I'm Roisin, I'm in Dublin in Dr. Stevens and today we have Jennifer Quaglietta. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so uh, we have Jennifer and we also have Maureen Flynn from the Quality Improvement Division, both down in Cork, um, saying hello to us today. So today's webinar is on creating a culture of continuous quality improvement and as you know, QI Talk Time, is, the purpose of that is to connect improvers across Ireland and otherwise to, to join up and share and learn from others' experiences of quality improvement. Jennifer and um, Maureen are at the IADLAM, so the, the, the Directors of Nursing Conference down in Cork, uh, which Jennifer is speaking at tomorrow, so she's going to share some of her wisdom with us today. So Jennifer is um, the Director of Patient Quality and Person-Centered Care in New York General Hospital in Toronto. Um, she's developed a QI framework and uh, is also has been heavily involved in patient and family-centered care strategy in Toronto. So she has received numerous accolades uh, for her work in, in Toronto. So she's received the Canadian Patient Safety Institute Award in 2017, Patient Safety Champion Award, and also um, to receive the Public Service Award from Ontario um, and uh, Project Manager of the Year Award. So lots on her CV, and we're really looking forward to hearing from her today. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we want to try and keep the webinar as interactive as possible. There will be time at the end to ask Jennifer questions or if you have any comments at all we will have time for those at the end as well. So please use the chat box, which is the top right-hand corner of your screen, and type in any questions or comments throughout the webinar. You'll see there as well, we have the telephone number and event number for today's event. You can dial in, and the sound is much better if you dial in over the phone than through the PC. So keep the questions coming, and we are active on Twitter, so please use our hashtag, our, our, sorry, our Twitter handle at QI Talk Time today if you're tweeting anything on today's webinar. So I, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jennifer. Uh, thanks a million, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the warm introductions. Um, this is my first time here in Ireland, and um, I'm very impressed by the beauty and the greenery and how warm and welcoming all of the people are and have been. Um, and thank you both to Roisin and uh, Maureen for having uh, me here during your QI talk time today. Um, it's a pleasure and a humbling experience for me. Um, I prepared my presentation um, to talk a little bit about how integration sort of marries with uh, uh, quality and delivering um, quality care. And so um, with that, I thought I would um, start by sharing a story about Toby Nickel. Um, the, the story I'm going to share with you really speaks to each component of an integrated quality agenda, which hopefully will inspire you to think about those principles and how um, they apply to the care that you deliver here to your unique and diverse population. Uh, Toby's story will demonstrate how 1% of uh, the population in Ontario uses about a third of our healthcare spending. Um, Ontario is uh, a province within the country of Canada, and we have about um, 13 and a half million citizens uh, within the province, and our total current fiscal spend within the healthcare budget this year is estimated to be about $61.3 billion, which is more than 50% of our entire provincial budget. So to think that $20 billion is going to be spent on 136,000 people is, is, is shocking. Um, Toby Nickel was an alcoholic and a drug addict. He spent most of his nights in Toronto shelters. He stole with swagger. He went in and out of jail and then usually found himself in an emergency department after passing out or getting beaten up by a predator looking for uh, a check. Um, he suffered from depression and anxiety. Uh, born in South Africa, he grew up in orphanages until he was five. Um, when a Mennonite pastor and a nurse uh, adopted him and brought him home to a small northern uh, town in Ontario. Um, he was the only black child at his school, um, and, and children were quite mean to him. They threw rocks at him. They bullied him. But he persevered and eventually graduated, um, started working at a local coffee shop, and worked his way up to becoming a manager. Um, he coached a soccer team and had a good support system of friends. But something inside of him still spoke to him about not feeling like he truly belonged um, in his culture. 
Um, he started drinking and using recreational drugs, um, then started using cocaine. Eventually, uh, he left his job, he hit rock bottom, and he went from living in a basement apartment um, to a shelter in downtown Toronto. And when someone like Toby goes to a hospital, he's actually entering a state-of-the-art medical facility that is entirely unsuited to help him. But the ED visit, and the ED is the only 24-7 uh, open door available, a place where, you know, Toby could go without being turned away. Uh, but the ED is for urgent care, uh, not the slow-moving years uh, of long crisis that Toby was living. Um, you know, detox is safe for a few days, but not prolonged support. Um, homeless people in, in Toronto average about two visits per year, eight times um, higher than the average. The top 10% like Toby encounter about 39 um, visits with ambulances and, and 12 ED visits, and uh, all of which are very expensive. Um, I would say that the top 1% of our uh, population using our healthcare system definitely include um, patients with congestive heart failure, preemies in the NICU, and adults with cancer going through chemotherapy, but also people like Toby Nichol. And about nine years ago, a gentleman by the name of Robin Griller tried to figure out um, how these vulnerable patients um, with complex needs could get off the streets. Um, but the wait list for supporting the housing took years, and during their wait, they would relapse and go back to detox. And those in rehab didn't have enough money to sustain themselves being out of, out of detox, and so people were just living in detox. Um, using the ED every other day up to 160 visits per year back in 2009 uh, with an average cost of $34,000 per, per person just for detox. Um, but since then, a number of initiatives have been put into place um, to improve the uh, quality of life and the delivery of care services for the population. Um, the Toronto Community Addictions Team was formed in 2010, and they had very specific aims. Uh, and AIMS is an, is an important word um, when we talk about quality improvement. Um, their aim was to work with people with complex substance abuse uh, with eight or more admissions to detox within 12 months, or five ED visits within two months, or um, 20 visits in the last year. Um, a team of five would take care of 100 clients, and the care team included addiction doctors, mental health and harm reduction workers, case managers, um, system navigators with no limit to the partnership, access to housing, education, primary care, community resources, and centers for support, and the list goes on. Um, so Toby entered the program in 2012. His case manager's name was Nadia, and at first, you know, she said he was very quiet. They just watched the children playing baseball in the park, and she wanted just to make him feel comfortable. They soon after started talking about goals. He didn't want an abstinent, but um, he also didn't want to ruin his life. Um, he started seeing his care team. He spent less money on drinking. He started going to the food bank. He signed up for cooking classes. Um, and when he relapsed, Nadia was there for him. And three years in the program, Toby landed his first job. And, you know, so we think about, you know, upon reflection, what worked. And really and truly, it's the village of people that surrounded him, the village of compassionate people who gave him a sense of purpose and respect and treated him with dignity. Um, and eight years into the program, um, ED visits have reduced by 78% for this population. Um, cost of health care spend has reduced dramatically for this population. Um, the team has 153 clients enrolled today. The program is always full. So yes, we have interventions for the severe acute, but if we don't have interventions to stop people from getting really sick, and then over time they're just going to get more of the same coming into the system. Today, Toby has been in detox for years. He's in control of his life. He isn't cured, but he's now able to manage, and his care is integrated. Um, the care that, provide, that is provided to him, uh, whether an acute primary in the community, is effective and safe. His providers work together to help him access and navigate and understand the type of care that he needs so he's able to align himself when he needs it. His assigned navigator uh, ensures that services are received in a timely manner, and most importantly, his care is centered around him. All the components of what uh, comprise of an integrated high-quality healthcare system. Uh, thinking about stories like Toby and mapping it to improving the quality of care that we deliver, um, I think it's really important to share stories like this one and others because if we don't fundamentally understand them, then what we aim to measure and what we aim to do, uh, the goals that we define, will mislead us to achieving results that are not aligned to transforming the system as a whole. To provide some context, Canada is the second largest country in the world by geography and has just over 36 million citizens. 17% um, of Canadians live in rural, rural areas, um, and in 1966, Medicare uh, was introduced. 
Um, across the quite expansive geography, we have uh, 13 interlocking provincial and territorial health insurance plans um, that are governed by the iconic legislation, the Canada Health Act, where the federal government contributes towards financing healthcare systems across systems, and in exchange, provinces and territories meet the basic conditions. So, for example, all residents um, have reasonable access to medically necessary hospital and physician services on a prepaid basis. Um, it's not a national system. Um, there are separate systems for populations designated under the federal government, and each province or territory um, is a single payer for insurance services. Um, in Ontario, we are the last province in the country to have and hold a decentralized model. Um, and within that model, we have 14 local health integration networks, um, and they're responsible for supporting the planning of healthcare services. Um, they hold agreements with all healthcare providers uh, to set out funding and performance deliverables so that local services are aligned with provincial priorities. Um, given that we are one of the lowest per capita costs of healthcare among the OECD countries, uh, we still have many challenges. Um, we do have some of the, long, the longest wait times for elective care uh, when compared to OECD countries. Um, our access to care is actually ranked last or second last. Um, less than 50% of Canadians have access to a primary care provider on the same day or next day. Um, and 66% of Canadians um, have to go to an ED on evenings or weekends um, because there is no access to primary care. Um, and 40 7% of Canadians actually go to the ED not because they need emergency care, but because there actually is nowhere else to go. Um, services outside of the Medicare basket are often inaccessible. Um, up to one-third of Canadians don't have access to insurance or medicine or dental. 57% uh, of prescription drugs uh, and drug spending is privately financed, and the Indigenous health disparities are simply uh, unacceptable. Most recently, um, we have had a change in government with strict uh, fiscal constraints implicating the work that we do. Um, the province has been focused on large-scale transformative change, um, but that comes with significant startup costs. Um, we do also share um, with Ireland and, and most countries in the world uh, an aging population. Uh, we have an unequal distribution of funding where about 5% of the population uses 70% of, of the healthcare funding. Um, and as Dr. Danielle Martin um, uh, says, you know, uh, physicians have privileges in, uh, to practice in hospitals. There's this sort of constant dance between physicians and government where uh, physicians are publicly paid and do not accept private payments but remain independent entrepreneurs to build state insurance plans for their services, but they are not employed by the government or healthcare service of any kind. They are simply fee-for-service. Um, the complexity of our patient married with the fiscal constraints has left um, much of our staff, uh, clinical staff, burned out. Um, access to care um, is improving, but not fast enough. Um, hallway medicine, they say, has taken a break for the summer months, but um, the flu season is right around the corner and surely to hit the system again soon. Um, indicators and targets in some areas are not aligned to provincial priorities and simply can't be, given the vast differences in, in services and priorities in northern, rural, and small hospitals when compared to the downtown academic teaching multi-site systems. And finally, let's not forget all of the work that's required to sustain the gains of improvement and improvement work. But there is a plan. Um, the system is working in partnership to, sh to shift the system to the left of, of the curve that you see here on the screen. Um, you know, to work on the proactive side of health and promoting healthy living and the use of new models of care such as telemedicine. But, um, you know, more assisted living beds are becoming available and primary care models have transformed to provide more holistic and accessible care, extending hours into the evenings and weekends to avoid unnecessary ED visits. So there is a case for integrating care and value to be created. Uh, for our system in Ontario, it started back in 2010 when the government made a very bold commitment to strive for the delivery of high quality, excellent care that has been a mandate for almost a decade now. Um, and, and at that time, I was working at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the uh, provincial governing body for the delivery of health care services. And um, I was uh, yeah, happily and, and very delighted to support the development and launch of what we call the Excellent Care for All Act. Uh, in my opinion, it's the most seminal legislation since the introduction of Medicare, and simply put, it uh, created a shared sense of purpose, a shared vision for all healthcare organizations across the system to understand and relate to and adopt. Um, and in order to have large-scale transformative change that drives impact at the system level right down to the bedside, um, you have to ha start with a shared vision. And so for organizations, ECFA was the, you know, the stance for us to put patients first, 
It defined quality for the healthcare sector by reinforcing shared responsibility of quality of care, building on uh, and supporting boards' capability to oversee the delivery of that care, and ensuring that organizations made information about their commitment to quality publicly available. For patients, uh, excellent care for all provided standards to ensure that they received health care of the highest possible quality and value. Uh, and simply put, it aims to improve the quality of Ontario's healthcare system by ensuring that the patients are at the centre of the system, that decisions about care are best uh, based on the best evidence available, and that the system is focused on uh, the best use of its resources. So I think in today's dynamic and complex changing environment that these challenges are not going to quickly disappear, but change and quality and quality improvement um, can absolutely be lived at the bedside, provided some keys to success that I'd like to share with each of you today. Um, but first, a little bit about um, the hospital where I work, uh, North York General Hospital. Our hospital is a community academic uh, hospital affiliated with the University of Toronto. We see over uh, 1,000 nursing and allied healthcare students each year and have established research chairs in five uh, of the areas of health service delivery. Um, in Ontario, our hospital services just over 400,000 citizens across our three sites, ranging from um, acute care intervention to our ambulatory care centre as well as our long-term care home. Um, our 5,000 staff, physicians and volunteers embrace the belief that you know, patients and their families are at the heart of everything we do and we, we try and, and strive to put this into action every day. Um, as you can see from our strategy, our value statement is stated boldly and it, it is what anchors uh, our strategic pillars. Um, our strategic pillars um, that you see there on the top in the dark blue um, is uh, our priorities that we have on our journey to achieve excellence in integrated patient care through learning, innovation and partnerships. And specifically, the deliver pillar um, of the strategy ensures that the work um, that we do is focused on improvement to access, safety, and quality of patient care within uh, and beyond the walls of our hospital. So by no means have we tackled the integration agenda, but we have started, um, and it sort of started with a, a um, deep sense of culture uh, with continuous quality improvement. Um, for us, it started with the culture. Uh, 15 years ago, the organization committed to quality um, a quality department was created with a number of staff whose expertise uh, was in lean methodology. So things like five-day Kaizen events, uh, reductions in the eight forms of waste, process improvement, all of those uh, really started off in the emergency department. Lean thinking became the new standard and the norm. PDSA became the new lingo. Uh, commission by cards became the new audit. Um, events were attended by senior leadership team and change ideas were prioritized. Um, and many nurses and physicians, after seeing demonstrable results, results, became champions and eventually sponsors of change ideas and process transformation. Uh, so today we have, I would say, a very healthy organizational culture of curiosity, inclusion, and service excellence. Um, we have been awarded Canvas uh, 10 most admired corporate cultures, and we have integrated care across many journeys. Our uh, integrated funding models for COPD, CHF, and stroke and our integrated care collaboratives for hip and knee replacements and breast cancer um, provide our patients with personal health navigators so that health care is coordinated and there really is only one person to call. So how have we done it? Um, how have we sustained the gains so far and how have we continued to evolve our culture of continuous improvement? Um, and I'll go back to excellent care for all and, and given that vision that was mandated uh, almost a decade ago, um, I'll take you through our keys to success that have been able to position our organization strategically, that have helped us to improve access to care, uh, that have cultural change, revolutionize knowledge translation, and build capable and long-standing environments. Uh, one of the first tasks that I was asked to do uh, and responsible for upon hire a number of years ago was to create a quality improvement framework. And, you know, the first thing I said was, well, why would I do that? Um, Health Quality Ontario is Ontario's quality agency that was created from that ECFA legislation and responsible for developing evidence and care standards for supporting continuous quality improvement across the province and for publicly monitoring and reporting. Their framework that you see here on the screen um, defines quality in a way that every organization can adopt. Um, and with the approval of senior leadership team, uh, the organization now aligned to the provincial standard and framework for quality. The framework was the perfect match uh, for us at the hospital. Um, defining the work of quality, safety, and risk at an operational level is just as important. Um, a few years ago, the organization undertook um, uh, sort of a process to refresh and bring quality to the program level. 
And the model that you see here really does help managers and directors plan for quality at that sort of local level. Um, and that includes thinking about risks and mitigations to put in place, um, how we educate and plan for safety to ensure that our workers don't experience, for example, workplace violence, how we plan and monitor for quality, and how it supports resource planning to meet the needs to deliver exceptional care. Um, all of the inputs, inputs define our criteria for success, while the inputs directly feed back into the corporate framework uh, for quality. Uh, and I think frameworks like this one or others do allow leaders to align to and share in the vision for that high quality healthcare system while still being able to focus on local delivery. Um, continuing from that macro scale down to the micro level, I think it's really important for those that work in quality to be very clear and explicit about the work that they do. And I can tell you that at North York General Hospital, our quality improvement office model is quite simple. It's rooted in concepts um, such as the NHS's change model, Theta Care's principles on a lean management system, and it strives to achieve the goals of a highly reliable organization. Our quality improvement specialists focus on four things, primarily. First, they strive to eliminate waste through lean. Uh, for example, setting par levels in supply rooms to ensure that min and max volumes are set so that no products are allowed long enough to expire, uh, but that there are enough products around for the ice storm that never seems to come. Um, second, the specialists aim to reduce variation through Six Sigma. So, for example, um, ensuring as often as possible that the wait times for an X-ray average around 45 minutes. Third, the specialists aim to optimize schedules through uh, simulation modeling. One moment here that the lights went out. And we can still see you okay, Jennifer. It's all right. Yeah. Um, through simulation modeling. So, for example, um, where one area uh, or when one area in our emergency department um, is at capacity, we have uh, documented an escalation pathway and algorithm um, to move patients into other areas to ensure maximum utilization of our beds and minimize uh, wait times for our patients. And finally, our specialists aim to improve the patient experience through design thinking and ethnographic interviewing. Um, so, for example, in ED, we know that um, uh, patients will have a better experience if um, someone is there to explain to them why the waits are so long and offer them a warm cup of coffee or tea uh, for those waiting in triage. Further to defining the work, I also think it's important to be transparent about the work um, that we do and hold ourselves accountable to the commitment. At North York General Hospital on a quarterly basis, we share with the entire organization all of the work of quality at all levels. Unit-based improvements such as standard work for the pediatric reception desk are equally as important and communicated as the departmental work for reducing medical imaging wait times, as is the corporate work uh, that's being completed on false prevention or hospital-acquired pressure injuries and many others. The work of the organization is clear so that staff understand why projects waiting in the queue have not yet been prioritized and change ideas are monitored to keep momentum and build awareness. Goals and objectives are linked all the way up to the corporate strategy Process and outcome indicators are included in each of the senior leadership team's uh, accountability agreements. Uh, even our VP of facilities is responsible for committing to targets for patient-centered care and quality. Um, in order for system level change to make an impact, change has to be also adopted at scale and at pace. The Joint Centers for Transformative Healthcare Innovation is a partnership that North York General Hospital started with seven other large community hospitals uh, that are focused on improving care through collaborative innovation. Um, its strategic directions include uh, to seek and share innovation uh, and innovative ideas through, um, uh, that, sorry, improve that value across the system. It serves as a living laboratory to demonstrate innovation. It serves to create opportunities for shared innovation, learning, and knowledge transfer, and uh, is to provide a forum for the rapid execution of new ideas, technologies, products, and processes. To date, our uh, community of joint centers together have reduced ED wait times. We've created a campaign and strategy to reduce workplace violence. We've shared a model for never events and innovative ways to provide more care at home through the use of tablets and virtually integrated medical equipment, to name a few. But system level change starts with local improvement and change at the bedside. Transforming a culture to one that is rooted in continuous quality improvement requires information sharing and transparency at the front line or point of care. 
And in order to do that and do it well, staff require access to high quality, reliable, and meaningful data. Our decision support, clinical informatics, and quality improvement teams are incredible at brokering information at the right time to the right people in the right format to drive action and improvement. They mine the data and provide status of indicators in real time in order to optimize patient flow. They analyze data in order for teams to understand where wait times are too long and where improvements can be made. Together with our quality team, they have started to apply predictive analytics and innovative algorithms to allow teams to make decisions that improve discharge times and mitigate bottlenecks before they occur. At North York General Hospital, each unit across the organization has an electronic quality board. The boards showcase outcome and process-based indicators that are relevant to the patient population on that specific unit. The television rotates continually showing current state indicators and targets that need to be achieved and even information about the unit in the event that a patient, family member or caregiver wants to connect with staff. On a weekly basis, each unit huddles for 10 minutes beside the board. They discuss metrics, quality improvement projects, and absolutely ask patients and family members to join in on the conversation where everything is shared. Our quality improvement specialists join also to know any support and quality improvement that's required, and common principles are shared to build capacity, and project successes are also showcased to reward and acknowledge the teams for the hard work that they've invested. Another key to success is the dynamic background that our quality improvement office brings to the organization. Um, here you'll see our quality improvement specialists that are industrial engineers with a lean six sigma green or black belt. Um, the staff bring a very different and unique perspective to improvement work. While they may not have a clinical background, they have the ability to depict, depict data in ways that provide motivation for change and a call to action. Uh, and the clinical part, while well, we leave that to the clinicians, of course, um, all of the projects have teams that are interprofessional, multidisciplinary, include physicians, have a senior leader as their executive sponsor, and definitely include one or more patients and family advisors. Building on the unique experiences of our team, we also have um, created some strategic partnerships with our surrounding universities. Our department, although small, has evolved over the years to truly becoming an academic epicenter. On average, our department takes in over 20 non-clinical students each year, ranging from undergraduate to master's and PhD. Our engineers bring new algorithm solutions not yet studied, for example, within portering services to improve times of dispatch. Our MBA students bring strategy uh, where it marries and meets quality. Our emergency management students bring support on the development of advanced policies and disaster preparedness. Our social work student brings a deep root understanding of patient and family-centered care, and the list continues. Although acting as a preceptor brings great responsibility and accountability, the time spent with our students prepares our future system leaders early on in their careers um, for quality and how to deliver uh, quality improvement work. Looking forward, the patient's perspective, voice, and partnership is one of the most important aspects of quality improvement. The Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care over the past few years has really advocated for the inclusion of an input from the patient, family member, or caregiver into improvement science. At North York General Hospital, we have 46 patient and family advisors who support over 80 committees across and at all levels of the organization, including our board. Last year, we embarked on creating a three-year patient and family-centered care strategy, and central to developing that strategy was meaningful and thoughtful engagement with our staff, physicians, volunteers, external partners, patients, families, caregivers, our patient and family advisors, and our patient and family advisory council. A key goal was to support and foster a culture of care focused on delivering engaged care in which patients, families, and healthcare providers actively collaborate on care delivery. Today, we wouldn't think of picking the paint color of our new chemo clinic or sofas in our main lobby without the opinions of our advisors. They have supported the hiring of our new president and CEO who starts in the next month. They've modified our policies to become more inclusive of the patient, and they continually educate us on what meaningful partnerships look like at the bedside. Building on shared conversations, at the end of it all, we have to be able to demonstrate success. Point-of-care staff are busy providing exceptional care to uh, our diverse populations. They don't have time, you know, to necessarily support the profiling of the work that they themselves have actually embarked on. The one, one unique role of uh, our quality team and our office 
is to prepare abstracts uh, for them. And once accepted at conferences, it's those teams that are provided the opportunity to attend and deliver the poster or presentation. Um, noted here, you'll see Margot Tuig, uh, one of our patient and family advisors that received the inaugural Minister's Medal for engaging with an organization. And similarly here, you will see some of our team members who were the recipients of the Canadian Patient Safety Champion Award last year and are the safety ambassadors for the organization. Um, nothing really encourages a collaborative work environment uh, like celebrating wins as a team and sharing in each other's successes. This really encourages everyone to have an interest in helping out a coworker that needs it. And everyone deserves and needs recognition. And I think by working together on common goals and sharing successes, we're able to encourage positivity and relationship building across the organization and in turn encourages employees to work with others outside of their teams, gives them joy in work, and most importantly, builds upon our culture of continuous quality improvement. So as you can see, by no means is North York General any more ahead of us in the system striving for excellence. Uh, along the last 20 years myself of working um, to create more value in the system, I've learned a lot. And what I can humbly share with you is that I've learned that it's critical to demonstrate value in quality improvement. In order to encourage grassroots adoption, you have to prove its value. And that can easily be done by showcasing pockets of demonstrated excellence from across the organization as each team or individual brings shared experiences to the table that are relatable, comparable, and translatable. I learned that to develop an effective quality improvement model, a framework has to be based on core concepts and proven results like those from uh, Health Quality Ontario or the NHS's change model and the principles of a highly reliable organization. I learned that in order to create expectations and uh, awareness and, and drive expectations and champion that change, um, you really need to have senior management on board. And this can be accomplished by engaging them in quality improvement, sharing key concepts and best practices, and building an accountability for quality by cascading goals and performance into accountability agreements. Their voice is absolutely needed at the beginning to keep momentum, to build awareness, and to create alignment. I've also learned to have the staff adopt to an open and honest communication philosophy where Common guiding principles have to be instilled, including workplace collaboration, honest feedback, and dedication to delivery and change. I learned that as a team, we have to have a nimble approach, and that was done by aligning and standardizing tools that could easily accommodate for the inevitable scope creep environment, because after all, patients do come first. I learned that customization makes work manageable and realistic, and allows for staff to communicate in a clear, compelling, and memorable manner. I learned to conform to the culture rather than to change it all at once. The frameworks and models adopted are easy to follow. They don't comprise of unnecessary steps or documentation, and everything is customizable, flexible, and aligned to our organization's specific processes, policies, and culture. And finally, I learned to introduce new informed concepts by demonstration. So integration is not a fantasy. It is taking place. We've conquered the linkage piece. I think we're getting better at coordinating and integration will be the focus for the next few years, and it all starts with the lessons that I've learned and shared. Just last month, the King's Fund released their annual report, um, this time focusing on their innovative concept called integrated care systems, and you may have seen the report already, uh, which they call the future model for health and health care in England. And I think they're really onto something great and impactful. I think if we reflect on the decades of health care that we've provided our populations, we no longer need our systems pr to provide episodic treatment for acute illness. I think, you know, they mentioned we need a number of things, five in particular um, pointed to, to myself. Um, we need, and what we need and have defined and tested is to deliver joint care uh, for our growing number of older people and people living with long-term conditions. We need governance uh, at the system level that promotes collaboration at the neighborhood level. We need leaders to lead across systems and create strong and trusting relationships and we need to include our communities in the design of our models, and we need clinical leadership to be involved at every step of the way. So to summarize, um, I think, uh, you know, some key takeaways of my presentation today is, you know, if you can use the latest evidence available to support best practice standards, you can do so easily by using examples that are applicable to your environment, proven to work, and are relatable to your audience. Um, second, leverage experiences from your colleagues because learning from them allows for organic uptake and adoption at scale for new processes. Third, if you can accommodate for different modes of change um, to be adopted uh, because there are different ways in which people learn and commit and a dynamic approach is always best. 
Um, forest and grace to environment flexibility is a key enabler of any methodology that's adopted. Fifth, uh, foster a philosophy of diplomacy and communication with guiding principles that include continuous improvement, shared responsibility, and accountability. By using the judgment and political acuity, implementation becomes easy, incorporates time and feedback um, from all. And finally, share. The more that you share, not only will you be acknowledged and recognized for your efforts, but you will also provide others with the help that they need to improve and leverage what has already been done. Remember that changing a culture is a journey and that the value of instituting a quality improvement framework is more than just standardizing a group of templates or processes. It's about integrating a team of people who work in different functional areas with different areas of expertise to work together in a collaborative and cohesive manner. It's about creating interdependencies so that work completed is linked, so that no parts have been missed nor completed more than once, and that the final product, whether a new product or in my organization, an improved service within a complex system, is one that is used, adopted, and superior to all the rest. Linking it back to the theme of the conference here at the IADM, there are many paths to integration. And for some, integrating health services starts with an understanding about what patients require in order to support them on their journey to health and health care. Uh, for others, uh, integrating health services means creating formulas in a simulation environment to determine the maximum conditions that a system can support and working within those confinements to deliver quality care, care that is accessible, equitable, efficient, effective, safe, and patient-centered. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, uh, Roshin here again. Uh, we have 48 online, actually, and the chat box is very quiet, so now is your time if you have any questions for Jennifer. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a really um, interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Um, I have a number of questions, actually, myself. Firstly, uh, we're on a journey in Ireland in training people in quality improvement, and from your organization's experience, you talk about having your QI office and your four or five QI experts who are, you know, trained in lean, trained in the different methodologies. Do you actually train your frontline staff in quality improvement methods, or is it that they partner up with people from your, from your office to deliver quality improvement on, um, projects? We do both. That's a great question. And so what we do is we... Um, we have uh, leadership cafes, we call them, or uh, blocks of learning times where the staff or myself uh, will go down and host a half a day event um, to teach the basics of quality improvement in the language. Um, but specifically, in order for that to happen for frontline staff, you need to be able to backfill on the unit. So that has been mm -hmm. something that the organization has committed to because without funding for the backfill of those uh, frontline um, staff, clinicians, and allied healthcare teams, they wouldn't be able to join in on um, the learning. The other thing that we do is um, we are part of new employee orientation. And so on day one, uh, any new member of the organization will um, hear about our culture of quality improvement and not only receive training from my staff on what quality improvement means and having a simple exercise, but we also train on patient and family-centered care and the principles of uh, partnering with our patients um, to deliver care, uh, treating them with respect and dignity, inviting them into uh, the decisions about their care and how we're, we're um, supposed to share information with them along each point of their journey. And so that starts from day one, and that's how we've started to sort of ingrain quality um, in the culture because it's what they're exposed to from the very start. Great, yeah, that, that's excellent. Um, I'm just wondering as well, um, you talked about patient advisors. Uh, do the patient advisors actually get any formal training or are they just people who volunteer and uh, are put in a path and pick to go on to certain committees or do they actually get some support in terms of training or um, background knowledge to support their efforts on the committee? For sure. So we have, uh, like I mentioned, 46 patient and family advisors who are part of a group of over 900 volunteers that we have across the organization. Um, they receive onboarding, so they learn about the organization, they hear about the strategy, um, they get to understand all the different departments and workings of the organization. Um, over the past few years, we've advanced that program, and just two weeks ago, we launched our first 
uh, patient and family advisor uh, skills cafe. And so we asked them, you know, we've heard from you um, that you want to learn more and, and um, how can we help facilitate that? And so they gave us a number of points. One was on quality improvement, another one was on hiring panels and how they could better interview candidates for their roles. Um, as it's mandated across the organization that all uh, management at all levels, uh, every panel needs to include in a patient family advisor and have a patient-centered question. And so uh, we've actually partnered with them starting a few weeks ago to deliver specialized um, training in the areas that they want more support and to um, help them feel uh, more courageous at the conversation level at the tables that they're at in um, asking the right questions and uh, and knowing all of the acronyms um, that are around. So we, we've mm -hmm. started to partner with them as we evolve our culture of uh, patient to family centered care. Great. And one thing that yeah. kind of struck me throughout the presentation um, really was around uh, the centralized versus the decentralized model for QI. And so from your experience, what would you see like the pros and cons of a centralized versus a decentralized model? So I think there's pros and cons to both models. Um, so what we actually have at North York General is, a, is an almost a bridged model between the two where all of the quality improvement staff that specifically deliver on quality improvement projects do report into my office. However, they have dual responsibility and accountability to each of their programs. So each of the five specialists are aligned to one specific program, which brings them more joy at work and, and uh, confidence in learning more about the specifics of that particular program. Uh, but then collectively as a group, they're able to support more of the corporate projects and have a greater, a greater exposure um, and connection to the organization as a whole and to keep their work dynamic and, and refreshed on an ongoing basis. So, um, you know, I think it depends on the amount of resources that you have. If, if uh, I think we're humbly very uh, privileged to have five resources in our hospital that support the work and dedicate, are dedicated solely and specifically to quality improvement. Um, but I've seen other organizations that um, provide opportunity to managers and leaders and champions, uh, you know, some basics on white belt, yellow belt, green belt training so that they're able to manage um, quality improvement projects on their own at the local level. Um, and so I think it depends on resourcing, I think it depends on timing and um, depends on, um, you know, how large your organization is and what the needs are. Um, and I know for us, we um, have a lot of work to do. We, we even with our 20 students, we don't um, have enough resources to, to, to even work on every project that comes through the office. Um, so I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, certainly in Ireland at the moment, we are not um, in the position to have th that resource in hospitals. Some hospitals are, we're starting on that journey, where some hospitals are, do have some dedicated QI resource, but it isn't really happening in, in many places. So our, our problem is just those we're doing it on top of our already uh, hard, long work list of, of jobs. So it can be difficult to get dedicated time for quality improvement. Perhaps one last question, um, and Maureen, maybe you have something? I do, Roshin, if that's okay. Uh, just to maybe continue that conversation a little bit in terms of the QI uh, support uh, central team. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned it's an integrated approach so that you have a role in terms of assurance as well. You might just share with us a little bit about your whole team, how that operates. So our, uh, my entire team actually includes in um, the work of patient relations specialists who uh, field complaints and compliments, um, patient safety and risk um, analysts who uh, work on um, incidents and incident reviews and med legals, um, and it also includes in our patient family centered care consultants. So uh, quality that comes in from all different aspects of the organization, not just um, uh, what you would see from um, an incident review, but also from from complaints from the patient experience um, and all of us working together to understand where those opportunities are and how to maybe um, take what's done at the local unit level and spread it across the organization more holistically um, so that the entire um, patient experience, no matter where you go or which floor you're admitted to, ultimately is improved because of um, the joint efforts of uh, many.
So that's an integrated that's an integrated, approach. Uh, integrated approach. So you have five, six staff working with you on quality improvement, and how, what would the whole team look like? What the size? The whole team, including a policy and procedures coordinator, is just under 20. 20, yeah. So a quarter of your team is dedicated to improvement work. I would say, yeah, yeah. That's really mm -hmm. interesting for us, yeah. thinking kind of about how we plan things uh, going forward in the future. I have one more question, and sorry, I'm hopping yeah, it yeah. uh, I'm really interested in your 10-minute huddle and uh, how that operates in at the individual, because that's so close to patients, and the uh, concept of including patients in your 10-minute huddle. You might just share a little bit about mm -hmm. that, if you wouldn't mind. So each of the uh, quality boards in each of the units um, showcase indicators, as I mentioned, that are uh, most relevant to that population, whether it's hand hygiene, um, falls, um, hospital-acquired pressure injuries, wait times, uh, length of stay, uh, and, and the list goes on, um, hospital-acquired conditions and so on. And so, uh, and, and then with that, each of the units have uh, sort of um, targets for where they want to see improvement. And so the uh, huddle operates that um, it's at a key time at the same time every week so that anybody actually in the organization can join uh, because they, they happen on a, a timed basis. And that it is truly only 10 minutes. You have one person. Um, in some instances, it's the unit manager, and in some instances, it's not. It's the educator or the point of care nurse or, or staff um, who start the huddle and introduce um, the concept of the huddle and uh, go through each of the metrics. Uh, and the group joins in and offers their feedback in terms of what's happening and, and what's not. Um, in some instances, they review their audit. So some, some of the boards have commissioned by cards where they've done their audit for um, the week and want to go over where um, the audits didn't meet the targets or where, where improvements can be made. Um, and then they talk about incidents and complaints and also, again, looping in where um, improvements can be made and where they can be shared. Um, and it's timed that it's, uh, there's one person who keeps time and one person who keeps um, notes. So there's what we call standard work for each individual who um, has a part to play in that huddle. And, um, and, and standing up. It's standing up, yep, standing and up. And visible. And visible. And it's very transparent. Absolutely transparent. And, and inclusive. And very inclusive. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's really interesting. We have particular projects on huddles happening at the moment in Ireland, which we're have finding are really dynamic and really focusing on improvement and improvements in process flows. Um, I don't know that we have huddles with patients joining them yet, yeah. so maybe that's a stretch idea for us to kind of take away from your uh, talk to just think a little bit more about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, Jennifer, you've been so clear in your talk. There actually has been no questions from people online. Um, so I think we might actually call it there um, mm -hmm. and, and leave. Sorry, Maureen, have you got one more? Can I just say one thing just because I didn't just think about it at the start. Uh, firstly, to thank Gavin and Casey in the Omen SD who introduced us uh, to Jennifer and made it possible uh, uh, for us to link up for the QI talk time today. And also particularly to Suzanne Dempsey, the president of the Irish Association of Directors of Nursing and Midwifery, who created time on the agenda today uh, and really is supportive of the concept of QI talk time. Uh, so just to note that, thank you, Roisin. Yeah, no, no problem, Maureen. And just to say, Jennifer, thank you so much again for giving us your time. An absolutely fantastic talk with lots of take-home messages and learnings for us and definitely practical things that we can take and start to look at. And hopefully we can link in together and share ideas uh, when you get back home to Canada. So thanks a million. And just uh, flicking on in the presentation there, just to say that there are some links uh, that are useful for people to go on to qualityimprovement.ie, and also there's an improvement knowledge and skills guide. On the um, uh, qualityimprovement.ie, there is a tab for QI talk time. If you go in there, you will see a sli the slide sets from previous webinars and also access to the recordings of the webinars. So please do avail of those and perhaps get your local team sitting around and start a conversation perhaps over lunch or something if you've missed today's webinar. So the next webinar is we're back to our normal Tuesday lunchtime. We had an exceptional circumstance today having one on a Thursday. So it's every second Tuesday at 1 p.m. 
And the next talk time is on policy procedures and guidelines and quality improvement. And we have Breed Boyce from the Quality Improvement Division in the HSC who has done a lot of work around this area. He's going to speak with us on Tuesday, the 16th of October. So thank you very much again, Jennifer, and thanks, Maureen, for all of your facilitation down at Cork. And we hope to see you all at the next talk time in two weeks' time. Thank you. Thanks, Roisin Sloan. Bye.